Hi, I'm Christopher Ross, BSC, the Director of Photography for CATS, and you're listening to the Go Creative Show. Hey everyone, my name is Ben Consoli. I am a director and owner of BC Media Productions. This is the Go Creative Show, the show dedicated to creative professionals and filmmakers. Today we talk about the brand new film adaptation of Cats with director of photography, Christopher Ross. The Go Creative Show is supported by Hedge, Shutterstock, Rule Boston Camera, and Premium Beat. Well, I want to start today's show with a giant thank you to all of you supportive Go Creative Show listeners. Um, We're in our 200th episode. This is our 200th episode. I'm absolutely blown away. This is a milestone for us. You know, we've been doing this show for nearly seven years now. I might even, we might even be into our seventh year. It's insane. We've reached number one on iTunes multiple times, nearly 2 million downloads. Um, got an opportunity to talk with, uh, you know, A-list directors of photography and production designers. And I mean, it's just been such a wild ride and I'm so appreciative of all the support out there. So thank you guys. Now, we wanted to do something kind of different for our 200th episode, but it didn't really work out because um, we got an opportunity to talk to Christopher Ross, the director of photography for Cats, and that's who we're talking to today. And I certainly do not want to move that interview just because of the number of the episode. No, 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 no. So what we're going to do instead is early in January, we're going to have an episode with a panel of filmmaking experts. Now, we've done this before in the past, um, I think about two or three years ago, and we're going to do it again. We've got my director of photography, Chris Lochran, who works on all the BC Media Productions jobs. We're going to talk to colorist Rob Bissett, and we're going to bring Matt Russell back on the show to talk about audio. And it's going to be kind of a roundup of what we saw in 2019 and what we are expecting in 2020 in film, uh, film and video production. So it's going to be an awesome conversation. We did that a couple of years ago. It was a huge success and we are doing it again. And that's going to act as our 200 episode celebration. So that's going to be a fun one. So look, uh, look forward to that in early January. But now it's all about cats. We've got Christopher Ross, the director of photography for the film, coming on in just a couple of minutes. And we've got tons to talk about, including how he was filming on these gigantic, oversized, large-scale sets and some tips for filming choreography. We haven't talked about that um, that much on Go Creative Show. So there's a lot to learn there. You guys are going to like it. Now, do you know what the hot color trends in video production will be in 2020? Well, you could know. You could know. All you have to do is visit the blog at Shutterstock. Yes, Shutterstock. You know, we talk about Shutterstock every week, obviously. They've got millions of images, millions of video clips. We have those fantastic Shutterstock select clips that I've been talking about. Um, But I want to bring your attention to their blog. Their blog is excellent. They've got a million different stories there, and they are so dedicated to educating us, uh, us, you know, creatives in the film and production community. Their blog is broken up into categories, editors, designers, business, uh, video production, of course. Um, And they just have these really interesting stories like this Color Trends 2020, uh, where they talk about what is to come. Um, They give you the the hex code. They give you some clips that are in that color range. Uh, Color is so important in in videography and filmmaking that sometimes when you're looking for that stock clip, you want to have something that fits your color palette. Shutterstock is paying attention to those things, and they're making sure that they are giving us all uh, information about how to incorporate color into your productions. I mean, this is just one of a million great stories on the blog. Um, What I love about it is it shows their dedication to educating us. That is super important. So you you go to the blog. It's free. Learn. Just check it out for yourself. Get inspired. That's what Shutterstock is all about. Check them out at Shutterstock.com. All right. We've got so much to get into with Christopher Ross, the director of photography for Cats. So I'm here with Christopher Ross, the director of photography for Cats and a whole bunch of other films that we're going to be talking about too. Christopher, thank you so much for being on. Thank you so much for the invitation. 
um, it's a pleasure to come and talk about um, cinematography. I can't wait to hear about it because Cats is very unique for a bunch of reasons. Uh, the large scale sets, uh, the cinematography, lighting. It just, it's such a fantastical adventure <laughs> that uh, there's going to be a lot to talk about. So I'm looking forward to that. But I kind of want to start with just setting the scene here. You just came back from a screening of this in New York and you have had no sleep at all. So it's, uh, <laughs> we're really catching you in the thick of this, aren't we? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and, um, and, you know, as Tom said, the premiere, so the premiere was, was Monday night. And, um, and as Tom said at the premiere, we, we literally finished the film at, um, 8 AM Sunday morning with just enough time to, uh, strike the DCP, uh, between, between 8 AM and, and, uh, well, what was it? Twenty-one hours later, when it needed to get on a plane and and get to New York for the for the Monday night, so it's been a it's been a race it's been a race to get the film finished and a, and a race to 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 do the best job we could, kind of thing. Wow! So they were really what like what work was still being done? You know, less uh, than a day before the the release. There was there was work going on uh, continuously with with VFX. So I so mm. I'm obviously party to the very final moment of of bedding all of the material together in the grade with our, with our, uh, amazing colorist, um, Adam Glassman. And, um, and so, and so we had, you know, uh, about four weeks ago, we had every, we had a version of every shot in the film. Um, and then, and then Tom every day would go into VFX, uh, reviews and, and make notes to make things better. And the VFX team carried on going, and and over those four weeks, there were there were vast improvements to 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 the work or improvements that we were that we felt were, were worthy of of finding their way into the film, and that led all the way up until until that Sunday mo Sunday morning when we were dropping shots in in the middle of the night, uh, Saturday night into Sunday morning to then finesse in the grade and get ready. So yeah, it's been um it's been a race to a race to get this to the to the finishing post. The Tom we're talking about, by the way, is Tom Hooper, the film's director. Now, the trailer for this came out a long time ago, like months ago. And yeah. do you ever kind of get nervous when trailers come out that early? Because people are so judgmental about trailers that it, it can work as a positive or a negative when you put a trailer out there and, and sort of set the scene for people's expectations. I mean, how do you feel about that? Yeah, well, well, I guess I guess because I'm a, a, a DP rather than a, a director or a producer, I tend to I tend to think uh, more empirically about the work, which, which is, you know, the the work that we do is based on script and you know thousands of creative conversations, and that culminates in the in the creation of a huge sort of collaborative experience. That, that goes to the cinema and the and the trailers are are are, are uh, I guess a an, an indicator of that ultimate creative intent um, and they're viewed by audiences and the audiences form opinions of which we the filmmakers have no control yeah. And so, and so, the one thing that that was apparent with the, when the trailer came out was that there was a huge reception to that trailer. You know, I think, I think in the first four weeks of the trailer being out, it was seen by 120 million people, or downloaded and viewed by 120 million people. So, Universal and Working Title were were very happy with the um, with the um, with the. I guess the audience feed, feedback kind of thing. Yeah. And then, and then there was, and then um, because they were relatively preliminary visual effects shots that were in that trailer, I think there were 96 shots in that first trailer. Um, Tom uh, director used it as a guide to refine the work going forwards. Hmm. So, um, so yeah, but it was a great response. Yeah. I think you're seeing that more and more too. Like I think that Sonic the Hedgehog movie put a trailer out, people were, they hated the look of Sonic. And I think the yeah. whole, everything kind of stopped and they just completely restructured the look of Sonic. Um, yeah. People are really, I mean, studios, I think, are really responding to 
um, or reacting to the response uh, of the trailers that go out. It's kind of interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, what was what, what's uh, what I find interesting about what I what I found interesting about the first conversations that we had about cats when I joined the team was that was that you know what you usually get what animators in visual effects houses are usually doing is uh, anthropomorphizing inanimate objects. So they're more used to taking a toy like a cowboy and turning him into Woody or, or, you know, a spork and turning it into Sporky. Um, What they're less used to doing is, is uh, animalizing human human beings yeah and taking that taking what is essentially human and blending it with something that is that is um idiosyncratically animal um and i found that really really interesting um because what tom wanted to do was he wanted to move away from the original you know stage show concept of these floppy tails that follow actors around and and static ears um and bring their characters to to the fore with the use of tails and and um and uh, an ear animation um and that i think is one of the things that that um that was moved forward quite away from the from the first trailer was that a hard sell for people uh, uh, no, I don't think so. I, I mean, I think, I think, uh, you know, it's, um, uh, the concept of the film, the concept of these characters is really, really out there. And, and I think what we're asking audiences to do is to buy into this felonization of the, of the performers. Mm. Um, and they're not cats because they can't be cats because cats walk on four legs and don't sing. Um, and and, and, and yet, that would be so. Yeah. So yet, yeah. So so a, a two hour a two hour version of real cats attempting to do this is a film that I that I definitely never want to see. Um, <laughs> but the but the felinized um, uh, ballet dancers and the felinized uh, vocalists that that, that we have uh, amongst our cast are, are definitely you know entirely captivating. Um, uh, and I think, I think audiences will respond. Let's talk about the set design, which uh-huh. is, you know, in the trailers, um, it certainly looks very real, but I thought to myself, it's gotta be for the most part CG. It has to be. But the more I'm learning about this film and, and, you know, now seeing more trailers and seeing more behind the scenes, these are real sets, large, gigantic scale sets. I absolutely love this move to a more um, practical type of cinematography. What are your thoughts? So yeah, so we had so the the production designer is this uh, amazing um, amazing designer called Eve Stewart, and she'd worked with Tom on on his previous uh, three films, um, and uh, yeah, she's truly astonishing, and it was. Uh, conversations between Tom and Eve that led to the scaling of the ca- of the of the world so the scale so it's it's, it's hard to scale a cat and a human uh, because cats walk on four legs and humans on two but but if you if you um, stand a cat on its hind legs and equate that with a with an averagely sized human standing you know on his two legs then the scale that you get is two and 2.5 times. And so that was the scale applied to all of the all of the sets. So um, our uh, our bedroom, for an ex- as an example, um, the bedroom of Mungo Jerry's set, which was one of the first that we that we photographed, was um, thirty eight feet deep by thirty feet wide wow. um, as a as a single room and twenty. The soundstage was 29 feet high, um, which wasn't high enough for the actual ceiling. So the ceiling and the and the top sort of three feet of the room are are CG hmm. uh, as a set extension. Um, the the door to the bedroom is 24 feet high, 
um, and uh, nine inches deep instead of you know instead of the the three inches uh, the three inches deep of a of a regular um, hardwood door of of that of that era. Um, so yeah, so we had this. So so that was, for example, one of our one of our spaces um, that was built. We also built Jenny Any Dot's kitchen to the same sort of a scale. Um, the the street uh, where Grizabella sings Memory, the Rum Tum Tugger sing, sings um, sings um, uh, uh, his his song, and, and Buster for Jones. All of those songs are sung in a in a scaled up replica of a street in Soho called Great Windmill Street, um, and they were and it was built on a soundstage on L stage in Leavesden which is 440 feet long wow. by 110 feet wide. Um, What's the height on that? And that it's still 29 feet high. Oh, okay. So, so it's a basically all the street was built to the, to the top of the first floor, yeah. the top of the, the top of the ground floor. And so everything above that is a set extension. So, so from a design and lighting perspective, we knew that there was a, uh, uh, above the windmill theatre, there was a big awning, and we wanted a certain colour of light to 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 be emanated by the the awning of the the awning of the of the theatre, and um, and the Rising Sun Pub, as an example, has a large uh, neon sign above the door, um, and then there's a theatre at one end which has an illuminated sign, and so I placed. Uh, fixtures into the into the into the rigging that would reflect off of the surface of the cobbles and the paving slabs uh, to mimic the lights that would be drawn in in our set extensions. Mm. Basically, yeah. We're talk to me about some of the challenges of filming at a scale like that. Like, what sort of accommodations do you need to make in your cinematography to account for the scale? Um, well, uh, it's pretty, yeah, it's, uh, pretty complicated. Yeah. Um, I would imagine um, things like camera moves would be difficult. I mean, the perspectives are all, are all strange. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the one thing, the one thing that you, so you need to, to, to look at a sort of three, three sides of things. One is, one is the, how do you deal with, um, the mind's perception of depth? So how do we make sure that the cat's, look small against this big backdrop but also how do we make sure that the backdrop doesn't look big but the cats look small yeah is one is one is one side of things the other side of things well, before is, you is, before you even go yeah. to the next thing how how do you do that if you use a very wide angle lens that what tends to happen with the with the with the image so the wider you go the the center of frame tends to tends to uh, remain distortion free, but the edges of the lens tend to uh, have an amplified magnification, and therefore uh, they distort perspective. Yeah, and therefore, as a viewer looking at that image, you know that you are being manipulated. Um, but the irony with the scenario is when you build a very very big set. Um, you need to use very wide lenses in order to see off the top of the set. You know, if you mm. want to stand on a on a soundstage and see the height of a door um, that's twenty four feet high, you need to use a wide angle lens to to see that height. So you're we were you're immediately caught in a in a in a catch twenty two, um, and that was one of the reasons, one of the things that led us to using the Alexa sixty five. Um, and the prime DNA lenses was that uh, when you shoot um, uh, like a, a match, a like for like uh, angle of view on an Alexa 65. So as an example, you can shoot on an Alexa 65 on a 28 mil, which is approximately equivalent to a, to a standard Alexa on a 14 millimeter. Mm. And the 14 millimeter on a standard Alexa has uh, has uh, shows is shows um, exhibits uh, uh, problematic um, linear distortion problems basically, mm. whereas the 28 mil on the Alexa 65 
feels more like a 50 mil on on the regular Alexa because it lacks this it lacks this linear distortion. So um, similar so, to the way that like I'm sure a lot of people in our audience may have like a uh, may have like a um, a 35 millimeter crop camera and a full frame camera and the lenses yeah. look drastically different on exactly. either of them. Yeah. Exactly. And like, you know, and, and like, uh, you know, if, if, if any of the audience members have ever mixed, you know, shooting, you know, 35 millimeter street photography uh, with a, with maybe a Mamiya 6.7 or a, or a, a, a Mamiya 7 rangefinder, mm. and you notice that the 40 millimeter on the, on the Mamiya rangefinder has a much more, uh, a much more relaxed, uh, uh, wide angle view and that's because the the lens the lenses the lenses that are doing the work are having to do less work over the same pieces of glass in order to get the same angle of view because your target size is much bigger mm. and so that was and so that was one of the reasons for going with the Alexa 65 basically as well as the fact that it's sim- very simply put the the best the best you know most beautiful digital camera you know, in the world right now. Yeah. Um, it's, it's sort of unsurpassable in its image quality. Let's take a quick moment and talk about Hedge. Hedge is a backup software for filmmakers. Now, it, it allows you to import multiple sources and send it to multiple destinations at the same time, so it's perfect for creating multiple backups on set. Um, You can get the Hedge Connect app for your phone and get a notification when the transfer is done. Um, It's a free app. And they are constantly updating Hedge to make sure that you have the latest and greatest in backup software. Now, I use Hedge on sets like this. You know, I get the camera cards from my camera operators. I get cards from my audio techs, behind-the-scenes photographers. I throw them all into Hedge, and then... I set my destinations as two separate hard drives so I can have a double backup. Uh, Press transfer, and I just let it go. That's it. It is simple, and that's exactly what you want. You want it to be simple. You want it to be fast. Now, before I was using Hedge, I was just dragging files all over the finder, Um, and I hated that. You know, I never, you're never 100% sure that your media is being backed up correctly. Um, You certainly don't have the type of tools that allow you to have these multiple backups and all of that. You're certainly not going to get a notification from your finder when something's done. No. Hedge is the professional way to manage your media and to back up your media. And the media is the most important thing at the end of the shoot day, so treat it the right way. Now, you go to hedge.video forward slash go creative show. You get 20% off the full license. Um, And there's also a whole bunch of other license options there, too. But I strongly urge you to check this um, check this software out. They are always updating it so you have the latest and greatest. These guys are obsessed with making the best backup software possible and so much more. It's all there at hedge.video forward slash go creative show. What focal lengths were you working in? So, so we, we had a full range of the, of the prime DNA. So the widest lens is the, is a 12 mil ranging, uh, 12, uh, uh, 18, 21, uh, 28, and then all the way up to, to the 200 millimeter. Sure. But we, but we tended to sit between the 28 and the 55. Did you have to do anything to the lenses to eliminate any distortion in, in the lens? Or, I mean, I'm sure you could do it in post too, but did you do anything to the lenses? No, no, we, I, I tested a lot of, a lot of the, the, I get basically the medium format, style of lens, the prime DNAs, the signatures, Tequinas, Tequina Vistas, the Sigmas, um, and, and the prime DNAs were the best, um, had the best, uh, contrast for us to use basically. Mm. Um, and, um, and provided that we stayed upwards of the 21 millimeter didn't really show. So the 21 millimeter was a signature prime. But um, upwards of the 21 millimeter didn't really show uh, any linear distortion uh, problems. Um, and then there are a couple of couple of like a couple of shots in the rum tum tugger and a couple of Craig shots where we needed to get very very wide, but with very limited uh, limited camera height capability. Because you know 
what we wanted to do is we wanted to do in our street the equivalent of a crane shot in a regular street um but we were limited to the to the to the top of the ground floor <clears throat> so you couldn't really do a crane shot like you would normally do in a street so um there were a couple of shots that we did that were on the 12 millimeter to fake that we were even higher hmm. so you must have you probably had to move really fast too to to adjust for that scale like the crane Absolutely. shot yeah, yeah yeah what were you just yeah. like you you were just tilting down more drastically or did yeah, you just yeah the swing the crane to make the crane shot feel um feel uh relevant to the environment yeah. you have to move the crane significantly faster so any shot that was purely architectural and that wasn't specifically about a, a dance you know an element of a dance a graphical shape of a dance or a or a character um or a character a piece of character emotion or whatever when it was when it was here are the cats in this space um those crane shots were would would were achieved at two and a half times the 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 crane speed hmm. basically to make it feel like you were in a, a real human scale environment. How did you address close-ups or not even close-ups, but when, uh, or even medium shots, like, are you worried at all about the close-ups and the medium shots losing that scale because of just the nature of how tight the shot is? And because the sets are so big, you don't really get to see much of them. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So when I first met Tom, uh, we'd spoke, uh, I, I brought a sort of a presentation to him that was, that analysed um, uh, what Piccadilly Circus and Trafalgar Square looked like in the 1930s, what sort of light illumination was around, what colour gaslight really is, um, uh, uh, bits about... Um, uh, scaling. So I brought lots of lots of examples from Toy Story about how you deal with scale. Yeah. Um, and, and one of the main ways you deal with scale is that you don't do close-ups. So if you look at if you watch any one of the Toy Stories, you very rarely, other than in the most emotional moments, have a close-up of Woody or a close-up of Buzz. They're always, um, uh, you know, they're always cowboy thighs and up on on the on the 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 toys. Um, and that's one of the things um, that helps keep the scale is that you're always seeing uh, uh, a bigger world in relation to a smaller, smaller toy. Um, we don't have that luxury. We have um, characters that are singing lead vocal for, for four and a half minutes. <clears throat> and so the way that the way that we worked around that was to, was to, try to retain as many depth cues as possible. So I used a lot of smoke in the backgrounds to give a sense of diminishing perspective uh, in even the smaller sets mm. to try to make the, the smaller sets feel, feel significantly deeper. And we tended to use much wider lenses. So, um, so most of the close-ups in the film are on a 35 millimeter or a 45 millimeter. Um, and so you, the 45 was, is really the, the, for me was like the hero lens of the, of the set whereby you could, you could, you get this beautiful, soft roundness to the close-ups, like a real three dimensionality to, to, um, to the focus fall off and the way the, the lens renders a face, but you also um, get to see a huge amount of set. So it was it was about trying to keep as much set in as possible at the same time, um, and also to keep to keep um, things in frame that give you a guide in the real world as to how big the cats are. So you'll often see them next to a next to an oversized chair, or next to an oversized bin, or next to a curb, or next to a milk bottle. <clears throat> the idea being that that these everyday items <clears throat> act as a de as a as a scaling guide as a depth cue to to how big our world is basically. Hmm. So we kind of we we kind of sit in this in this 
hybrid world where it's absolutely impossible in every shot to keep the sense of scale. But what we need to be able to do is every every three shots to have a reminder so that you so that you feel intimately involved with the with the the vocalist or intimately involved in the dance routine and then and then you're reminded of the scale just so that it becomes it becomes a, a, you know a thing that you keep in the back of your mind but also we have to realize that what we're trying to do is also a a, a deeply emotional connection with our with our cast members and with our characters and so you can't be too draconian about your um about the way that you deal with uh scale and the way that you deal with um uh the oversizedness of things and you have to let a little bit of chaos and a little bit of fun come into things because that's where that's where the emotion comes and if you're not connected to the characters because you're trying to keep a keep a tag on keep a handle on how big things are then 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 you push things too far the the other way Mm. now with all the visual effects um i'm assuming these actors are wearing like motion capture suits for the fur to attach onto later um did you have to make any you know did you have to make any decisions by way of camera or lens or even format that you're shooting in in order to account for that yeah, well, so the so the the um, the dancers were basically wearing like an all in one uh, leotard with fluorescent tracking markers on certain parts of their body. Um, some of the dancers were wearing um, a t- certain type of suit called an XN suit for um, uh, positional data capture underneath this underneath this lycra suit. Um, the I guess the most significant thing that I did uh, that I got involved in with the VFX and, and costume department was to twin the color of the costumes to the color of the cats that they were, to the color the cats were going to end up. So that um, what I didn't want to do is I didn't want to go for a very soft, sort of generic top light as can as can as can happen in vfx heavy films Mm. i wanted there to be a real character to the to the light i wanted there to be hard light i wanted there to be deep shadows i wanted there to be high contrast at times um i wanted the world to feel uh, as real as possible. So there are, you know, so as an example, the, the, the bedroom has a, has a, a light that comes into the room through the crack of the door as if it's from the hallway light. And also it comes through the main part of the door and is, and creates a, a, an area of light and shadow as if it's a bare bulb in the hallway type thing. Mm-hmm. And, and that by using that technique, when you look at the room without the cats in, in a wide frame, it feels exactly like a real space. So for me, it was all about making the spaces look real in the widest imagery and then to manipulate the close-ups in a way that were characterful for the for the characters basically and so one of the things that we i was very wary of was uh, the vfx thing wanted all the cats to be in you know varying degrees of of blue and green screen suits and um uh, and they're you know from a lighting perspective they're a bit of a night they're a complete nightmare because they bounce yeah. green light everywhere and yeah it's a sort of a disaster so what i wanted to do is when the when two cats were nuzzling each other and one of the cats was white and one of the cats was brown, that the white cat had brown light bounced into her eyes and the, and the, and the brown cat had white light bounced into her eyes and that, that, we could, that we could use that light in its original colour in the final piece. You achieved that by or just the, altering the wardrobe to 
altering the wardrobe yeah. to the to the exact color of the of the of the cat. I mean, that's not you know, it's not a it's not a thing that happens all the time, but it definitely was a thing that stopped us from having this um this sort of proliferation of green and blue light around the sets that we lit that we lit hard. Um, yeah, I can imagine, especially with like tons of dancers standing near each other. I mean, the bounce would have been terrible. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so we wanted, and there's, you know, in the big theater set, there's a, there's a very big, uh, a very large, hard moonlight source. Um, that's not, it's not particularly hard in the end because it's, uh, because the moon is, I scaled the lighting, uh, by two and a half times as well. So, so that we could get the equivalent shadow hardness, basically. Yeah. Um, but so the so the front face, say you would use an eighteen k that has a, a front face of a front face of about three feet for um for your for your moonlight. If you were going to use one of those lights, I would build a rig that was that was two and a half times that. So we'd have a, a circle of of light that was you know nine feet across a nine feet in diameter in order to produce a, 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 a column of light for our moonlight so that it felt so that it felt when you were using coherent light that the coherent light was um was coming from a, a source that was human sized rather than cat sized hmm. god it's just it sounds so math mathematical <laughs> like it sounds like a science project this whole thing uh having to worry about all the scaling and this oh my god there's so much more that's going into it than I think anybody watching is going to realize. Uh, yeah, but that that that's a I think that's a good thing. I think of um, course. I think uh, if it can if you can watch the film and it looks effortless, then um, then You've done we've your done job. job. Exactly. Yeah, exactly we, yeah. w- one of our um, Facebook uh, friends here, Diego Fabricio uh, Diaz Palomo, asks. How yeah. were you involved in the production design for the whole movie? Sounds like you were involved in at least wardrobe, but anything else? I know Eve Stewart, your production designer, we talked about earlier in the show. Um, talk about the involvement you had in pre-production and production yeah. design. Well, so, so Eve, and, Eve and, and Tom have made, um, so this is their, I think this is their fourth film together. And um, and they have an incredibly close collaboration. And and I worked with Eve on a on a on a different project about three years ago. And at that point, they were gearing up to make Cats um, sometime in the near future. And she had already put together a whole a whole a whole heap of you know amazing concept art for for Tom to to pitch to the studio and to to bounce around conversations. Um, and so they've they've pretty much been working on the project for about four years, wow. I think, by the time that I that I showed up. And um and and by the time that I'd showed up, um Eve had already began begun work on, on constructing the sets. You know, the the um the construction of the L stage uh street set uh took about 18 weeks from start to finish. Mm-hmm. Um and I came on board with up uh, with about um 12 weeks of pre-production to go. Um, and so, so the, my involvement really with the production design was, was working with Eve and her team to coordinate where the practical lighting, where that would go, how that would, how we could utilize, how I could utilize practical lighting to motivate other light sources and, and conversely by utilizing uh, my light sources motivate where a practical could go. Mm. So the idea was that we knew that we had at least three more stories of Soho above our level on the street and in all the different environments. Um, and so we wanted it to feel like this uh, neon, neon lit um, uh, sort of um yeah neon lit collision of color it's a um, it's an extraordinarily colorful film i mean that's yeah that's for sure um well, the one thing so the thing that i wanted to try to do is so if you if you actually analyze a street streets at a small scale are really quite boring because at human level the amount of light that you 
that there is in a in a sort of a night a standard nylon exterior set um, covers if you expand the distance covers a huge zone. So one street light actually when you multiply the light from that one street light can cover half of our sound stage. Mm. And and I felt that that would be that would be um, uh, long term would prove fairly tedious that you would be that these cats would never be able to move from one light source to another light source like you you know so what makes what makes a night a night exterior walk and talk scene dramatic is this evolution of light as someone walks down the street the street light falls off and it becomes, you know, a street light goes from a front light to a side light to a back light. And then the next street light takes over. So you get this, you know, in just 30 feet of a character walking, you get storytelling simply by, simply by the light modeling around someone's face. Yeah. Yeah. That and makes sense. So for me, it was, so for me, it was like, how do I do that at this bigger scale? So, so, the way that I worked it was that I said, right, so the windmill has a color associated with it and the milk bar has a color associated with it and the and the outside of Jenny Anydot's house has a color associated with it and the Egyptian has a color associated with it. And so as characters move around this street, they evolve from one space to another space. Mm. And so hopefully you feel as you're watching the film that that there's a new evolution of 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 story as they as they move around the space. And the same goes for the the, the theatre. So about, about 40% of the film exists in the Egyptian theatre set. And it starts with um it starts with the Jellical Ball and then moves on to Gus the Theatre Cat, then it moves on to uh, Skimble Shanks the Railway Cat, then it moves on to Mr. Mistopheles, and then finally Memory, and then the journey to the Heaviside Layer. So you have all of these musical numbers that are existing within the same space. And so by using characters to control their environment, I modified the coloration and the and the lighting style for each of the routines, basically. Um, oh, and McCavity, I forgot McCavity. McCavity is also in the same space. And so as each character takes over the takes over the environment, the environment modifies to uh, to resemble their story. So McCavity is a big show-stopping number. She's a she's like a cabaret act. And so when when Taylor comes on comes down on her moon, there's moving lights and and a real kind of Chicago style cabaret style light show that the that trans that transforms the space uh for Taylor's for Taylor's routine. Whereas Gus the Theatre Cat is speaking about, you know, the death of the death of uh uh traditional sort of vaudevillian theatre. And so he's lit just by the footlights of the theatre. And the rest of the the rest of the theatre's plunged into darkness. So it was about it was about how do I how do we modify this space to make the to make it emotionally cohesive with the uh, with the uh, with the characters, but also to um, to in such a huge scale render some form of visual storytelling uh, and evolution of movement kind of thing. You are listening to the premiumbeat.com song of the week. This one is called Beacon in Deep Space by Viami Meto. Premium Beat, of course, is where to go for all of your royalty-free music and sound effects. Over at premiumbeat.com, you get access to a collection of thousands of royalty-free tracks for as low as 49 bucks each. $49! You don't just get the individual track, no. Most of the songs have stems and cut downs and loop sets. Really what you're getting is amazing quality music that fits your project perfectly and all the pieces to customize it. It really is amazing what they give you for 50 bucks, it's crazy. 
So check out this song, um, Beacon in the Deep Space, um, and also check out some other tracks too. I know you're going to find something that you love. I do, all the time, all the time. Premiumbeat.com. Oh, we have so much more to talk about with Christopher Ross, but just want to take a quick break and talk about Rule Boston Camera. Rule is the place to go to purchase and rent all of your production equipment. You know why? Because all the big, huge Hollywood films that come through Boston, they use Rule. Of course they do. Because Rule is the best. It's the biggest, it's the best, and they've got a gigantic world-class inventory of everything that you could possibly need. Cameras, audio, lighting, grip gear, communications, they have it all. They've been in business for nearly 40 years, so you can imagine what they have in there. But the most important thing is their customer service, because production is mission critical. You know, you're renting because you don't own the equipment, and if you don't own the equipment, you may not know it as well as you would like to. And Rule makes sure that you understand this equipment before you take it out. You're going to get um, expert advice and counsel in pre-production, technical guidance when you take the equipment out for your shoot, and they're committed to support you uh, while you're on location. We're talking about peace of mind, and that's why I continue to go to Rule all the time. I'm there pretty much weekly. I guess that's a good sign. It means we're busy. I love that. Rule.com, R-U-L-E.com. Check it out for yourself and experience the Rule way. I had read that in preparation for shooting this, you you gave yourself a history lesson in film musicals, starting at 42nd Street, going all the way to La La Land. Uh, what did you learn from that experience watching, you know, film musicals? Yeah, I watched a lot of film musicals. I, I put together like a 45 minute edit of of some of great musical, like iconic musical moments that I shared with Tom, um, which were, yeah, raging from 42nd Street, Singing in the Rain, American in Paris, um, you know, cabaret. And so one of the things that you find is very, very common is the use of a proscenium, of a proscenium uh, layering um, and geometry. Um, so right from so Broadway fil- Melody. Filming as if it were a stage. Yeah, absolutely. So you've got to, so you go, okay, right, centre frame is our dancer, left and right of frame are our, are our backing dancers. It's a thing that, it's a thing that, that, that is used to exemplify stage, you know, being on stage, basically, yeah. the replication of the stage experience. So that's, that's one thing. Then uh, another thing is that the, the use of the wide frame. So, you know, like Fred Astaire famously had his, his when I'm dancing, you have to see my full body um, clause in his contract. Yeah, you got to so see the feet. You got to see the feet exactly. So that was a that was another thing. And if you look at, you know, you can look at Broadway Melody of 1936. You can look at West Side Story. You can look at La La Land. And you can look at, you know, um, videos from This Is a, you know This Is America or, or or Lemonade, and it's the same. You know, you find yourself in the same scenario. Um, uh, but one thing that we that we wanted to do was to 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 play with this idea of the proscenium, and so we wanted to have the the proscenium capability, or at least the 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 layering. So not not necessarily the proscenium capability, but the layering and the geometry of the dance to be in multiple axes. So it wasn't just front on where you saw a you know a geometric version of the dance so you could shoot one moment front on one moment that same moment in profile and that same moment at 45 degrees and you would have the same sort of layering that was that was like one thing that that we that we um that we came to learn from the from the like the history of musicals yeah um the other thing that you learn is the the use of spotlight and the use of um, hard light to to show um, the graphic form of a of a body in the middle of a dance, um, and you use soft light to 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 show the the, the beauty of the lead vocalist. Yeah, so pretty pretty standard stuff. Um, 
Now, did uh, you, w with these lessons, you know, you're armed with these lessons, you're armed with that education. Did yeah. you seek to, you know, replicate some of these things in cats or were you trying to break the mold a little bit? Uh, a bit of both, basically. So there, there are times, so so the macavity, as an example, is a, is, is a, um, uh, is a cabaret number, and so there are many times where we create a um, uh, a proscenium arch for Taylor to 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 do to control the floor with basically in different places, yeah. and then and then uh, in in counter to that, the Jellicle Ball is a kind of mesmer you know a mesmerizing dance extravaganza where all fifty two of our dancers become possessed by the moonlight and go off on a, you know, on a fantastical, yeah, adventure. Yeah. incredibly emotional experience. And, um, and for, for that, we were uh, using an almost constantly moving camera. There's a, there's a, there's a couple of sort of graphical frames whereby, whereby um, cats sort of address the moon. Um, and then we start to move alongside the cats and around the cats. So where there was a lot of sort of circular steady cam shots and uh, in interior um, spiraling steady cam maneuvers um, and crane top shots, that kind of a thing. Now, I mean, most people aren't or may not in their career get the opportunity to shoot these large scale, big choreographed scenes. Um, so I'd love to know from your experience, what, what are some things that people don't necessarily know about shooting that? Like what surprised you about how you have to address your coverage and your camera movements for large choreographed scenes? Yeah. Well, so, I mean, the, the, the lessons that you learn are, are, you know, often there's, often there's only one sweet spot for the choreography. Mm. And no matter how hard you try, they're, you know, six inches to the left or six inches to the right, and you're stacking dancers up. When you have that many dancers, um, and you've spiked all of the dancers on the on the soundstage floor, um, any error in a camera position or any error from one of the dancers can render the whole thing uh, can render the whole thing um, uh, uh, not useless, but but can but can show it ruins the, the shape of the shot ruin the shape. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So the dark, you know, it's, so that's the, uh, for me, that was the, the most difficult partnership is the song and the dance. Is there is something the, fun about that or was it frustrating being limited to only certain angles? No, there's a lot of fun. There's a lot of fun with that. Uh, I, I find it fun. The conundrum, I find the conundrum fun is like, okay, so this is our hero perspective. Where else is there? So what you'd find is if you drifted, if that one camera drifted a foot to the left or the right, then then that frame was ruined. But what you could do is you could move, you know, 45 degrees around and be on a different lens. And you the the positions that were that would be ruinous would be out of frame. And so it was about how do you, how do you, we shot with three cameras the whole time. So it was how, how do we find another sweet spot? How do we, where is there a, where is there a shot? So if this is the shot that shows the, the, like the spectacle of the dance. Now, where is the shot that shows the emotion of the dance or the, or the, or the acrobatic of the dance, mm. you know, that, that shows the sinewy, the sinewy strain on on the on the dancers muscles that kind of thing so it was about how do we how do we partner those up kind of thing were you involved at all in any of the choreography rehearsals or did you get a chance to um perhaps maybe even modify some stuff the way yeah. that you may have done in in with uh, wardrobe yeah absolutely well we, so we so andy blankenbuehler the the our choreographer um, amazing um amazing choreographer who um who uh, uh, took care of Hamilton and won a Tony for his for his hard work? Yeah, yeah. Um, he he was he had about ten weeks of rehearsals with the with the with the cast um, uh, and the and the main chorus dancers, and 
um, he started the rehearsals in the schedule order that we were due to shoot them um, uh, in the film. And so every day that they would be rehearsing, so they'd get in at, at six in the morning, Frankie would do an hour of ballet rehearsals with the, with the rest of the ballet dancers, and then, then they'd stretch for an hour, then they'd start main rehearsals at, at 8 a.m. with everybody else. Um, and, and they basically put a shape to each of the numbers, and then uh, Tom would generally be around for about half of that session in the morning. Um, I would come along at the end of that session, and, and Andy would run like the 30 seconds or the minutes worth of, of rehearsal that they'd been working on that morning. Yeah. And, and I'd photograph it. I'd dance around with the, you know, they'd, we'd do two or three takes of it. I'd dance around with my iPhone and shoot some frames, sometimes in the mix of it with, um, with Frankie, sometimes on the outs, outside of the, outside of the main ring to get a, to get a, 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 a view of it. And, um, uh, and then the same would happen in the afternoon and at sort of six o'clock as we were finishing off, I'd shoot another set of rehearsals and all of that material would go back to our, our sort of rehearsal log. Tom would rewatch it all. And then the next time we were rehearsing that number, uh, we'd address any of the, any of the notes basically. So yeah, it was a, it was a, and then, and then in the workshop, in the dance workshop, the production design team uh, built replicas of all of the sets uh, drawn out on the floor in tape so that the dancers knew where the walls were going to be, where the bins were going to be, where the curbs were going to be, so that so that Andy could choreograph the dancers exactly in tune with our real spaces. And then we'd then do, once the sets were constructed and once the choreography was, was settled, um, and he would then go and do even more rehearsals on the physical sound stages to get the dancers used to the oversized scale. You know, like things like, so our cobblestones were, you know, whereas a cobblestone would normally, you know, have a, have a, you know, a third of an inch um, sort of lip to the edge of the cobblestone. Our cobblestones had an inch lip. So you could easily twist an ankle or whatever. And our curbs, instead of being six inches high, were, you know, were 17 inches high. And so if you were doing a dance routine that revolved jumping up and down the curbs or jumping in and out of the milk flow or any of that stuff, actually, you know, you're jumping five feet in the air, six feet in the air. So we use lots and lots of wire rigs that you would never think that you would need to use. But a lot of our a lot of our cast were doing tumbles from 14 feet in the air down onto the ground and then into all fours and scampering away, Wow! you know, in, in, in a cat technique. So from both my perspective and from the, from the, from the performance perspective, you know, I, I hope we try to make it, I hope we try to make it look as effortless as possible, but actually, when you see what the dancers are physically doing, it's absolutely extreme. Um, and the sort of things that we're doing are absolutely extreme. We've got a question here on Instagram from satksax19. Uh, wants to know, why could cats not be shot like the adventures of Tintin, uh, putting CG people in CG environments? And um, I don't want to put more words in your mouth, but it seems like, well, I guess it could have been. It's just you guys chose not to. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so like, so... Um, uh, it's sort of a question more for for Tom director uh, than for myself, but I, I know the answer really comes down to a, a philosophical choice. So if you if you use motion capture and you um, you record a, uh, a human's performance in a motion capture space, what you're really doing is capturing their their facial features and an approximation of their body movements. And then you're really placing their facial features on an animated, on an animated object. Whereas what Tom wanted to do was to take the absolute precise uh, movement of the finest dancers in the world and to retain that fine 
uh, retain that fine movement and that fine detail in their muscle structure and their and their sense of tone and poise and grace and to have the and to have the animators only dealing with applying fur to those fine details and so and so that so that you don't have an animator so you don't have an you don't have a cat that can dance in a in a in a way that no human can yeah you have a cat that dances like the greatest human dancer can dance Uh, and again i mean this isn't this is an adaptation of a play where yeah. people are playing cats. So it's like it didn't it wouldn't have made sense to have the whole thing virtual. Um I mean that just it, it's not what that's not what this is. And I think it would be it, it would be a detriment to the to the movie and I think it would pull people out of the story to do that. So I'm glad you didn't. I think I think so. Yeah, I mean I think I think that was Tom's that was Tom's entire modus operandi really, which was everything about our environments should be real everything about the dance should be real and everything about the the physical performance should be retained and the absolute minimum uh of the performer is removed in the in the quest for fillification and so and so you know the the images of of uh, Jennifer, when she's singing "Memory," are as are as untouched as humanly possible to allow every every movement of her, her cheeks, every movement of her lips, every crease of an eye to come through in the performance. And the same goes for Frankie when she's dancing. Same goes for Robbie when he's dancing. Um, uh, it was all about how do we do? How do we get to a place where? you can you have these incredible feline characters that have as much human in them as as physically possible in our last couple minutes i just want to talk about your involvement uh or lack of involvement in post-production um talk to me about that um so yeah so i i finished on the film in uh at the end of principal photography in march and and went on to shoot another another film and i've really been back with the film since uh, since the middle of September, um, and so my involvement in post production has been mostly feeding back from a grading scenario into into what the visual effects work has been what the visual effects work has been doing. Mm. Um, but Tom has been very very uh, uh, very very kind to the original photography. And has used the original photography as the as the blueprint for everything that is done in the in the virtual world. So so um, only the lights that are illuminating our physical sets are the lights that are illuminating our cats. And so if there's a light that was illuminating a the cats on a soundstage in February then there's a light that directly replaces that light in a virtual environment to light the, the to fur. light the fur. Yeah, basically. That's so, cool. So, so everything again, we're seeing is what touch. was, everything we're seeing in the film is what was intended by you um, from a lighting perspective. I love that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, even, even, even to a point where I've said to Tom, uh, you know, wouldn't it be great if we didn't do that? <laughs> 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 well, wouldn't it be great if we maybe, yeah, wrapped it, wrapped the light around a little bit more, or you know, whatever? And he's like, no, 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 that's that's like that's filmmaking. That's what we did on the day. It's all about it's all about you know the lightning in the bottle, really, for Tom. So that's what we did on the day. That's the performance that was captured. That's the choice that Melanie, the editor, has made to include this moment because it has this poignancy. Let's not let's not mess. With that, let's work our way to augment that into our into our scenario, getting fur onto the onto the performers. But let's not let's not mess with the emotional content of the of the material by modifying anything. So yeah, so it's always been about going back to 
going back to what we did on the shoot day. And um, and I think if if Tom if Tom could do anything uh, again, um, the thing that he's spoken about, you know, wishing he did more of was building more sets. You know, he would have loved to have built Piccadilly Circus, but it was yeah. just too too vast a too vast a, a prospect for us. So that's Piccadilly Circus really is the only three hundred and sixty degree uh, blue screen green screen environment. Um, in the in the whole film, um, but I lit the environment as if there were 360 degrees of of you know neon lights and flashing advertising and all that sort of stuff. Um, and um, uh, yeah, well, you, and you the, can't the, the do it all, I guess. Yeah, exactly. You can't. And, and I'm sure a large portion of that budget was given to that gigantic star-studded cast. Wow. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I, I guess so. I mean, uh, you know, we had we had a uh, it was a very very ambitious project. I mean, it retain, remains a very very ambitious project. Um, and building at that scale, I know, was was incredibly expensive from a production design perspective. And yeah. lighting to that scale was, you know, so you know, just in the in the one street environment that we had, there were four thousand eight hundred channels of dimming. In the one street, um, oh my God. Uh, in the 440 feet, um, controlling practicals, controlling lights that were reflecting, reflecting uh, lights that were key lights, uh, controlling the milk bar and its and its crazy zany, you know, light show that it has during Rum Tum Tugger, um, you know, with two grand MA desks controlled by the desk ops Lawrence and Simon. Um, and under the watchful eye of, of, my, of my wonderful gaffer, Mark Clayton. Um, yeah, it was a huge, huge undertaking. And um, and I hope people respond to its ambition. Um, well, they certainly will. The film is absolutely amazing. It is so fun to watch. It must have been so fun to be part of. Uh, it's. Just, I'm just so thankful that it had it had gotten made. Like when you hear about the fact that they're bringing cats to to uh, the big screen, you're sort of like, really? <laughs> like, and then the more you hear about it, then then you start seeing the trail. You start seeing the behind the scenes. You're like, this is going to be a smash. So you've got a hit on your hands, and uh, well deserving of it. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Ben. Christopher Ross, BSC.com. You can find him on his website and on Instagram. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce this. E-D-J-I Bevel? E-D-J- edgy, yeah, Edgy Bevel. Edgy it Bevel. Was, it's a name that I was given by a, um, by a director, a friend of mine, Mark Evans, many years ago um, when he felt he felt that Christopher Ross was, was too ordinary a name for a cinematographer and I needed something more more uh more dark interesting and eastern european sounding um and so he he referred to me as edgy bevel and um and uh, and i like it so it's it stuck as my as my instagram tag there you go edgy bevel on instagram we'll put a link to all his stuff in the show notes we didn't even get a chance to talk about yesterday one of the best films of this year i think last uh this summer um the the beatles film i mean my god there's just so much to talk about and no more time. So we're going to have to have you back <laughs> to discuss. No I'd, well, I'd love to come back. Yeah. I had a lot of fun with, with I had a lot of fun with Danny Boyle on, on that, on that project. So yeah, there's lots to talk about there too. Well, there you go. Something to look forward to in 2020. We'll have you back to talk about your new film. And I, we got to talk about yesterday too. So that'll come up in a, in a, in an episode to come, but thank you so much, Christopher, for being on the go creative show. No worries. Thank you very much for the invite. It's been a total pleasure. I want to thank Christopher Ross for coming on Go Creative Show to talk about his new film, Cats. I'm really psyched for this one. It looks so good. I love movie musicals anyway, but I just love the realism that they're trying to portray in this film. It's really awesome. And it was cool just hearing how he, you know, filmed these things. What kind of, what he has to think about when he's shooting this stuff. Uh, for the scale and for it all. It was a really fun conversation. I hope you guys loved it. Please let us know what you think on our social media. Follow us at Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Let us know what you think of the show, guest suggestions, and also check us, uh, check us out regularly because we always let you know when we have upcoming guests and give you an opportunity to have your question heard on the show. I also want to thank our producer, Connor Crosby. You can find him at Ignition Visuals. 
Matt-Russell.com. And Matt Russell, who mixes and masters and makes the show sound so good, you can find him at Gainstructure.com. Gainstructure.com. Of course, it all begins with a visit at GoCreativeShow.com for all things Go Creative Show. 200 episodes, people. And we have you to thank. So thank you guys so much for being there, listening to the show. We are continuing on, certainly. Let's hear it for 200 more. I love the sound of that. Of course, I want to thank our sponsors, Rule Boston Camera, Shutterstock, Hedge, and Premium Beat. I want to thank you guys, too, because without you, we wouldn't have made it this far. So please, support those that support us, and we are going to keep going on to our next 200 episodes, right? Talk to you guys next week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.